our gold participants from around the world. Welcome to our gold learning online symposium, Tongue Tie Research and Implications. I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Bobby Geheri, and he is going to be presenting on breastfeeding improvement following tongue tie and lip tie release. Welcome, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I just have a few questions for you, and I know we've had the pleasure of you speaking for us before at Gold Learning here, but why don't you go ahead and just briefly reintroduce yourself and what you do, tell the delegates about why you wanted to speak about this particular subject. Well, my name is Bobby Geheri. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon located on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon. And roughly five years ago, I had the experience of going through a tongue and lip tie release with my younger daughter and really had my eyes opened to the potential improvements that could happen with appropriate diagnosis and care uh, surrounding breastfeeding. And um, because we had so many problems with my first child who, did, who had the same problems in retrospect and we didn't know about it, I began learning more about the topic and became more interested and over the course of that five-year span of time it's become a predominant part of my practice and I have always had a research mentality it's something that I have enjoyed doing uh, I've published before on other topics and what I noticed with a lot of the feedback and, and pushback from either primary care practitioners or other otolaryngologists was that the available evidence to support these procedures was relatively poor. And uh, with uh, Melissa Cole and several other practitioners, I set out to, to design a study that would help to establish better justification for why it is we do what we do. That's just wonderful, and it's great to have you be part of this community because I see, I see you a lot. Um, I know you're doing a lot, and so it's wonderful to have you uh, spend some time with us here with Gold to share some of that very important uh, information with us and research. Can you tell me, in your experience, and now that you've been around for a while, working in this field, seeing what's happening, research, what is the most significant changes that you've seen in the field to date? Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's probably a two-part answer. I think I think that they're related. The first is obviously much more awareness of the topic now than five years ago. When I first heard about it, when I started learning about it, overall I felt that it was a, a, a small group of people or small group of practitioners who had some information about it. So one of the major changes has just been the sheer amount of chatter about the topic and uh, people's understanding, people's desire to learn, uh, people even just figuring out that yes, this is a clinical entity that goes on that can affect breastfeeding. The second part of the changes I've seen in the field is the tremendous amount of reluctance of practitioners to learn about this topic, whether it be lactation consultants, speech pathologists, uh, or any provider like a dentist or primary care doctor or ear, nose, and throat surgeon, there is still a lot of resistance accepting the idea that restrictions in the mouth can sometimes be an impediment to how a baby feeds on the breast or on the bottle, to be honest. So the, the changes, I think, are both good and bad, and it, it doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, when I've lectured before, I tell people that much of what I do is based on an eight-year-old study by Donna Geddes in Australia. And eight years is nothing when it comes to the amount of time it takes doctors to change their practice and to learn more about it. So it, the, the, pushback, the pushback I hear doesn't surprise me. It's frustrating because it, it really takes a, a lot of effort to get people to come to the table and listen to what it is we have to say. But... I think in general we're gaining some more acceptance about the validity of what it is we do and and part of that is is providing a better basis scientifically to help those people justify in their heads why this is a reasonable procedure. 
Yes, I can, uh, I can sense and I see that pushback as well in the community, just in my very small neck of the woods with uh, the IBCLCs and, and the behavior of other uh, clinicians that uh, have either pushed right away, don't want to talk about it anymore, uh, and or are pushing, you know, forward with it. So it seems to be, you know, somehow we need to come in the middle and uh, really get some really good information and research going for sure. I, I wanted to ask you, Lastly, Dr. Gahari, just a little bit about what you're hoping our delegates will take away from this presentation. Oh, well, I have lots of hopes. Uh, I would say the the most the most significant ones I would say first and foremost is to understand that success with breastfeeding is not just about weight gain and is not just about avoiding nipple pain. That there are a lot of characteristics when it comes to breastfeeding and how the baby and the mom are interacting that can predict success or failure. And so what we set out to design was to look at some of those you know, alternate uh, quality of life indicators, breastfeeding, self-confidence, things that I think are not really emphasized in the existing body of literature. Uh, certainly the concept of anterior tongue tie versus posterior tongue tie and while I'm not a big fan of it because it allows people to decide not to believe in the presence of posterior tongue tie I think our study most definitively answers the question that posterior tongue tie is a real clinical entity and that the babies that have posterior tongue tie uh, can ex experience the same amount of improvement as those who have a more classic anterior tongue tie. And then certainly I think what I hope people understand is that from the from the standpoint of study design, you know, this isn't necessarily even something with respect to this particular study, but I do want people to understand how to critically think about scientific studies, how to help design future studies and different topics that may be helpful in, in furthering the field. And so it's more of a, a, a meta discussion about why certain studies can never be done and how we have to use the best available evidence we have to help guide our decision making. So, you know, if, if, if the if the delegates were able to use the information in these talks, not only mine, but in the remainder of the talks that are given in this symposium, I think it really does give you a foundation to help foster discussions with people who may not have that background. And it gives people a better grounding in how to approach these uh, somewhat very, you know, can sometimes very difficult dyads that need our assistance. Wow, I um, I just started to take notes <laughs> as you were speaking there. Uh, what a great way to uh, talk about the information that you're providing, that it will give us a platform to look at different research and how best to analyze that information as we move forward, because I think that we're really lacking that as well in our community. And I have to mention that I am a forever learner in this uh, field. Uh, because I too have a child who has a tongue tie, a posterior tongue tie, and so have been impacted, um, you know, in this field personally. So thank you so much just for sharing uh, your story and about what's happening, what you've seen, and what your hopes are. It's been great having you and sitting down and chatting with you today. Thank you so much. You're welcome, and I'm very excited. Well, that was Dr. Bobby Gehari. He'll be speaking at our Gold Learning Online Symposium, Tongue Tie Research and Implications, Breastfeeding Improvement Following Tongue Tie and Lip Tie Release. This is Fiona Lang-Sharp. Thank you very much for joining us today. Bye-bye for now.